title uh, from Archie to ACAC. ACAC is a uh, um, an anachronism in, in terms of uh, World War One. It's really uh, not a terminology that comes in until about 1939. Archie, uh, uh, for those of you that uh, aren't aren't aware, uh, that was a terminology that came in fairly early uh, in the First World War, and that came uh, the the consensus whether or not this is true or just a, a good story. Uh, that it came from future uh, Air Vice Marshal uh, uh, Amnes Borton, uh, and he was uh, one of the first RFC pilots to deploy uh, with the BEF. And there was a popular dance hall number at the time uh, by George Roby, uh, and it was uh, Archibald, certainly not. Uh, so the girl buzzing off uh, some guy named Archibald. So apparently. Uh, Orton, when he was flying, would kind of sing to himself to, to calm his nerves. And uh, when he was under fire by, uh, by German uh, anti-aircraft fire, he uh, was apparently singing this song a lot. So that's kind of the, the story of where Archie comes from. Uh, those of you that uh, were available uh, to hear my talk uh, last time, uh, or last year on the Capronis, uh, know that I, I talked a little bit about uh, sources. Uh, and the variety of digital assets that are now kind of coming online in conjunction with the Centennial. And that's very true uh, in regards to this talk as well. And there's really some fantastic stuff that's out there. And uh, I was, frankly, I was overwhelmed uh, in the process of doing uh, this presentation just by uh, just how much was out there. Uh, unfortunately, one of the last places I kind of looked into turned out to be one of the best, and that's uh, the Imperial War Museum. Uh, their search engine is a little clunky, uh, but um, really just uh, absolutely fantastic in terms of what it provides. So uh, you have to be a little bit clever in terms of uh, filtering and so forth, but uh, just in terms of First World War anti-aircraft, it uh, comes up with 442 photos. Uh, it's some really just kind of uh, amazing stuff. So uh, you can really go to town um, looking at those. The National Archives has been uh, very vigorous in putting uh, their World War I photography online and doing it in quite high resolution. The Imperial War Museum stuff, it's okay. They watermark it. Uh, it's not quite so easy to use. If you ever want to put it in a book, you're going to have to do uh, a lot of work to go through them to get permissions. The National Archives is pretty much set up, ready to go, um, you know, in terms of uh, repurposing the imagery. Uh, all public domain stuff. The primary collection that they've been working on recently uh, is the Signal Corps collection. So this is the uh, Record Group 111. Um, it has uh, probably about, to my best guess, about 70,000 images related to the First World War in it. Uh, now a, lot, a pretty good portion of those uh, are related to, to the AEF. Um, so it's, uh, you can see there's 437 pages here of uh, 100 results per page. Uh, so that comes out to be a little over 43,000. So they actually are nowhere near uh, through digitizing these things yet. So it's very much a work in progress. And unfortunately, they're only through about the first 10,000 or so with the captions installed. So they actually have 43,000-odd online uh, by this, this reference number, so this, uh, this number here after the SC, uh, that's the number that you can locate the in individual uh, images by. Uh, unfortunately, only 10,000 of them actually have the captions on them at the moment. So unless you know what that number is that corresponds to the image, uh, then it's pretty difficult to, to find them unless you go through them sequentially. A couple problems with that. Uh, the system will only recognize 10,000 images in a go, so uh, that's a little bit of an issue. So getting to those other images is a little bit of a problem. So you almost have to go in one by one and, and search each image number. Now there is a, a old school card catalog out at the National Archives. They can go and flip through in terms of a subject index and bring out cards that correspond to these numbers. Um, so it is a little bit of work uh, at the moment, but hopefully within the next year or so, uh, all those uh, statistics will uh, move towards completion. And but anyway, it, it's it's absolutely fantastic. So there's there's many thousands, there's probably at least ten thousand aviation images in there right now. So really, uh, 
just absolutely remarkable uh, resource. Uh, two others that uh, they've been working on, they're a little bit smaller. Uh, one is um, the Department of War Information uh, British uh, <coughs> photography from World War I. And so this is, uh, this is about a little under 2,000 images. Uh, there's some aviation coverage in there. So uh, it's certainly worth checking out as well. And then finally, there's uh, almost a thousand uh, German images as well uh, that are uh, available. So by all means, uh, check those out. I can share those slides with uh, anybody that's interested. The, uh, another good source, uh, Library of Congress. Uh, they've been posting quite a lot. Uh, typically, it's it's a uh, mostly domestic U.S., but they do have some uh, international coverage as well. And lastly, I, I do want to recommend the technical files uh, of the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, those are held at the moment downtown. Those will eventually be coming out here. Uh, but there's quite a lot, in, uh, particularly in terms of uh, reports from the Air Corps Tactical School in the 30s, where they were really looking at the problem of of anti-aircraft fire, uh, so a lot of studies about the First World War. So if this is a topic that you're interested in, uh, there's a lot available and it's, it's only increasing rapidly. <laughs> there has been a little bit of coverage in the, in the past in, in various sources. It's mostly been the artillery kind of community that's looked back at, at uh, anti-aircraft in the First World War. <laughs> uh, one exception is that in 2002, Over the Front did a really outstanding piece on German black in World War I uh, that's absolutely worth checking out if you get a chance. So when we think about uh, FLAC uh, or Archie or anti-aircraft, uh, choose your terminology, uh, in the First World War, we, we typically have a sense of it being somewhat improvised, that uh, uh, taking pot shots at aircraft. And so here we see uh, um, a, a field piece uh, mounted for anti-aircraft fire in Serbia. I'm not sure the date, probably 16. So, um, but you can see uh, fairly uh, improvised, not much opportunity to uh, accurately traverse it or sight it. Uh, typically when we think of machine guns uh, for anti-aircraft purpose, we, we think of something that's mounted on a wagon wheel uh, with this, this French piece. Here's uh, uh, Belgian uh, trenches. So it sense that it was fairly improvised and that uh, effectiveness uh, was fairly low, though occasionally they'd be brought down. This is probably a little bit more representative of the actual state of things in terms of anti-aircraft uh, technology in World War I. So it typically was focused on uh, heavier field pieces and uh, focused on um, being motorized. So maybe a little bit counterintuitive, but right from the outset, uh, those were really kind of the two paramount um, technical uh, parameters for anti-aircraft fire. So the, the focus was on fairly heavy, heavy pieces uh, with, that were rapidly deployable. So this is an Italian piece uh, being inspected by uh, Germans. Uh, let's see if I can get you a location on that one. That's, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have, it, November of 17 is the date, but I don't have a, a location on that one. That's probably right, uh, John. So the Germans had gotten invested in uh, anti-aircraft fire fairly early on. Uh, if you go down to the south end of the Udvar Hazy Center here later, you will see the uh, Balloonomania display that we have. And there's a wonderful display of the uh, jetons, the uh, coins that were minted during the Siege of Paris in 1871 for all the balloons that were used to uh, jump over the uh, Prussian lines out of Paris. And the uh, Prussians, of course, were beside themselves that the uh, French were, were actually able to keep that line of communication open. So they, uh, they launched a crash contract with Krupp to develop an anti-balloon cannon uh, that could be fielded, and uh, uh, that's what we're seeing here. That was not effective, so uh, no known victories with that. But anyway, the, uh, the Germans were uh, certainly thinking about anti-aircraft fire pretty early on, and in some fairly sophisticated ways. So 
Uh, here we see 1906. Uh, this is a Ryan uh vehicle that was uh, um, prototyped uh, for the German Army at that time. So uh, pretty sophisticated. It's armored. It's it's got a uh, uh, traversing gun that's uh, capable of pretty high elevation. And in fact, uh, a a simpler version of this was put in production on the eve of, of World War One. And so this is the the K flak. Um, type arrangement, and this is really what was considered the kind of typical uh, preference for a flak system on on most on the part of most of the major powers, even going in to World War One. And so, on the eve of uh, of the First World War, uh, this is really what was available um, in small numbers. In the case of Germany, it's really only about three dozen uh, at that time. Now, in terms of uh, kind of looking at anti-aircraft problems overall, uh, one of the things that, that became clear very quickly was that uh, if you're going to fly over the trenches, uh, you wanted to be at least 3,000 feet. So it was generally assumed that if you drop down below 3,000 feet, uh, there were a bunch of bored people in the trenches uh, looking for something to do, and should an aircraft fly th down that low, they were going to open up with everything they had. So pretty much uh, it was assumed that you weren't going to be able to uh, to fly below uh, the, uh, the trenches, uh, fly above the trenches below 3,000 feet. Uh, this type of 7.7 uh, .7, uh, or greater um, uh, field piece, the French were using uh, you know, 75 millimeter. Uh, typically 15,000 uh, was about the ceiling on that. That was elevated as the war went on. Uh, in terms of the Allies, they were claiming about one Central Powers aircraft destroyed by anti-aircraft for every four the pursuit aircraft were bringing down. Uh, we're not talking about a lot of aircraft. No Allied battery brought down more than 17 aircraft. In terms of overall claims for the, the warring nations, Germany had the, by far the highest. They were claiming uh, 1,588 brought down by anti-aircraft fire. France claimed 400. The Italians, 129. Uh, the BEF claimed 341, and the uh, AEF claimed 58. Um, so, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, uh, Germany, by uh, October they had 30. Like I said, they had 36 of these on hand. By 19, and and one issue to understand is is these were not coordinated units at that time. The idea was that they were mobile. You would kind of work. It was almost a ground-based intercept. You would have to kind of run out to where you thought the uh, aircraft were likely to ingress over the front and position these in the way. So really nothing in terms of detection, certainly nothing in terms of uh, central coordination or fire control at that time. So it was really a detachment of either two or four of these gun uh, platforms, these motorized gun platforms that were going out in the field and uh, if they happen to be in the right place at the right time, that's great. Uh, but for the most part, we're not seeing any sort of uh, defense in depth, and really nothing uh, particularly systematic at that time. Uh, in 1915 in Germany, they did start to change. Uh, they did begin to develop a uh, defense in depth at the front. Uh, it was coordinated through a headquarters at Frankfurt, and they were uh, beginning to develop a double cordon type arrangement uh, behind the front. Uh, balloons, uh, barrage balloons, and searchlights weren't really coming in until well into about 1917. Uh, there was a system uh, after 1915 where they started to implement forward observing stations. Uh, the Germans were very uh, conservative in terms of uh, uh, calling for air raid warnings, though. They didn't want to disrupt their war workers, so uh, they were only interested in issuing an air raid warning if they absolutely knew, knew where it was going to hit. So uh, their air defense warning system was probably not incredibly effective for uh, getting people into to shelters at, at the time. So this first defensive line was about two kilometers behind the front. Um, in terms of the uh, probably the most defended site in uh, German-held territory uh, was Heligoland. Uh, there, by the end of the war, they uh, or, or late in the war, they had uh, four 88 millimeters, six uh, seven uh, seven point six two uh, centimeter. They had uh, three 52 millimeter, eight 37 millimeter, and 105 millimeter. 
Um, so not a huge amount of, of defensive artillery, but by the standards of the time, uh, it, it was pretty impressive. Uh, the Germans claimed their first victory on August 26, 1914, a, a Blériot with a Lieutenant uh, Prettyman uh, uh, flying with Major uh, Boyd Moss as an observer, uh, and they were hit near Arras. Uh, in terms of the expenditure of firepower to bring down an aircraft, uh, it's pretty staggering. Post uh, First World War, the uh, the British were uh, the, the claim was that the British were expending thirty thousand rounds per kill uh, before you, before they were uh, successful in having a kill. Uh, the Germans uh, in nineteen fifteen. Uh, the figure that they had was 11,588 rounds before they got a victory. That had dropped uh, by 1918 to 5,040 rounds expended uh, for each kill. Um, the nature of the war, of course, changed a lot. Uh, typically, machine guns were actually uh, something that was implemented much later in terms of the campaign. So really the focus early on was the heavier artillery. Uh, machine guns really aren't being employed until balloon busting uh, becomes paramount, as well as uh, strafing. Uh, and so the, uh, the, machine gu the, the machine guns that you see the pictures of, typically you're looking at 1917 later for the most part on those. Um, the Germans did find that they had trouble with uh, Allied interdiction efforts, and uh, in July of, of 18, uh, the German Third Army Corps headquarters uh, in the aftermath of the, the Kaiser Schlag said in a memo to its commanders, quote, it is evident that during our offensives we have suffered extremely heavy losses from the enemy's aviators. So there was a, an awareness that uh, this kind of uh, lower level tactical defense was a, a bit of a problem. Now, when you're evaluating the success of these units, is there any way of measuring in terms not of hits but in terms of altering enemy behavior? So that is certainly mentioned in some of these uh, after action assessments, particularly in the 1930s. So it's often uh, stated that they, that because of the presence of this anti-aircraft fire, you know, they were pushing the uh, raiders up to a much higher altitude or observation aircraft. So, um, you know, the sense was, okay, we're pushing these aircraft up above 10,000 feet. Uh, and so we're, we're certainly altering the enemy's behavior uh, by doing that or chasing them off. Uh, they're not able to observe this position because we ran them off. Now, quantifying that, of course, is a much harder problem. Roger, in that picture on the left, is that device a listening thing or a... No, that's a, that's a uh, range finder. So it's a, essentially a stereoscopic uh, range finder. Uh, statistics on number of thousands of rounds fired per kill, uh, I'm assuming they're accounting just major artillery, not... That's correct. Not no, that's, not a machine, that's not a machine gun. In fact, kind of the, the uh, machine guns are, you know, they're almost uh, kind of considered beneath the um, scope of, of what's considered anti-aircraft fire for the most part uh, at this time. So uh, it's, it's a little bit, uh, the U.S. is probably the most vigorous in terms of um, thinking about uh, the kind of tactical aspect of, uh, of this in, in using uh, machine guns for, for uh, low altitude point defense. And so the, the other nations don't seem to be quite as focused on uh, either tactics or improvements in, in that technology and certainly aren't tracking it that much. So I don't have any data on uh, machine gun rounds expended. Uh, I'm just curious. Um, so by, uh, by the end of the war, uh, or at least October of 18, uh, Germany's position was they had so 524 uh, heavy guns, and by heavy we're talking some, anything other than machine guns. So typically 37 millimeter bigger. Uh, they had 524 for uh, strategic home defense, and in the field they had 946 in fixed positions and 155 truck mounted. And so here we can see a few more of the uh, truck mounted in, in various uh, uh, variations. Now this turned out, to, I found this one at the Library of Congress. This turns out to be uh, probably a pretty rare one. So this is a uh, 105 millimeter. So this was. Uh, uh, hit by an American uh, attack right at the uh, end of the war. Let's see if I can get the information on that one. Um, so this was uh, uh, just destroyed uh, at uh, Chateau Thierry. Um, 
the uh, yeah. So it, this was hit by an American aviator. Uh, don't know what the aircraft was. Sorry, that was the previous one. Question over here. Yeah. What did they do for fuses for their shell? So they were cut manually. I do have an image of that. Um, okay. So yeah, you you weren't going to have any sophisticated system like they had later in World War II, where it's it's all being set electronically uh, uh, fire. Um, so here we can see some uh, of the other uh, positions. So you know there were uh, arrangements for field pieces to be uh, configured uh, in this manner. Uh, German anti-aircraft uh, artillery did have uh, a great deal of success against uh, tank formations. So uh, they were often pressed, as they were in World War II, into uh, um, anti-tank roles. And speaking of anti-tank roles, the 88 millimeter does come in uh, during uh, World War I, though in a configuration that's, that's really operationally much, much different than the uh, Black 18 of, uh, of World War II fame. And of course, uh, nowhere near the high velocity capability of, of those. But the, uh, the same type of uh, wheeled employment uh, um, you know, with the with the stabilizing arms that came out, that was was available. We can see, uh, you know, better views of that. It doesn't look a lot like the uh, it's World War II brethren, but uh, there are only a hundred and I think about 160 of those deployed by the end of the war. So really, only the last four or five months. Uh, so here's a warning sign uh, that the Germans have put up about uh, essentially avoiding being strafed. So a lot of, like I said, a lot of concern, particularly. Uh, amongst the Germans at the end of the war, frustration about how to defeat uh, this low-flying aircraft. Here's a, uh, a position on a rail car, so uh, uh, the German interior is, is beginning to be exposed to air attack. We're seeing a lot more improvisations like that. And of course, here's probably the, the ultimate improvisation. Uh, so, so strapped to, to wooden blocks. And, and so this was designed to be actually a full traversing uh, piece here. So. Uh, out of, out, of, uh, yeah, out of desperation, uh, you could do just about anything. Uh, a lot of... Uh, we need you. So I don't have a lot on the Russian pieces, uh, but the Germans were uh, bringing a lot of the, the, the 7.62 uh, Russian pieces back from the Eastern Front and employing them in France. So these were uh, ones that uh, were being captured uh, from the Germans in France. So these are the, the Russian pieces. Uh, searchlights, uh, mobile searchlights were coming in really about the last year of the war. It's, it's a little hard to see, but um, you know, so you have a generator unit plus the plus the search searchlight. So Austro-Hungarians, um, you know, again we see a lot of the improvised uh, field pieces, uh, you know, mountaintop positions and so forth. They don't have a lot of a lot of coverage on the uh, Austro-Hungarians. I think they were the first. Uh, in terms of uh, the British, um, they really didn't have anything uh, immediately deployable uh, at the beginning. However, uh, they had already started work on their own uh, kind of comparable uh, program to what the Germans were doing in terms of their mo mobile uh, K-flag system. Uh, initially, the Navy had primary responsibility for anti-aircraft. Uh, at, at the uh, start of the war in 1914, they the only guns on hand were one four-inch, uh, four three-inch, and a bunch of uh, what they call one-pounder pom-pom guns. Uh, the pom-poms turned out to be pretty much totally useless. I do have a picture, I don't know if it made it in, of, of one being used in Mesopotamia on a, on a rail car. Um, but they also embraced that German model of, of essentially a kind of a ground-based <coughs> intercept. Uh, Early in the war, uh, because of the naval role, Churchill was actually uh, responsible for London's anti-aircraft defenses. And supposedly the first uh, British victory uh, was kind of during the initial Zeppelin panic uh, before they, they showed up in December of 1914, and a Royal Naval Air Service seaplane was shot down. Uh, I don't, I'm not entirely sure if that's accurate, but that's, that was a story uh, that seemed to get, get some currency. Uh, but by September of 15, when uh, the Zeppelin raids did begin in earnest, uh, London had 26 anti-aircraft guns, uh, but those were not effective over 10,000 feet. Uh, so what we're seeing here is the 13-pounder. Uh, uh, this is the Mark I. Uh, they did finish the uh, war with the Mark IV, which was essentially the same sort of configuration. It was a, uh, 
an 18 pounder that was re-sleeved to, to boost uh, performance. Uh, and that was capable, I think, up to about 17,000 feet. Um, this, this one was uh, capable up to about 16,000. Uh, one big technical problem they had to deal with was when you elevate the gun that high, the shell wants to fall out before you can close the breech. So they actually had to develop a, you know, a special catch. So that was one of the things they were particularly uh, proud of early on was, was developing a retaining catch so that they could actually fire at high elevation. Um, so the, the first of, of these Mark I uh, trucks went to France in uh, January of 1915. Uh, and so they were deployed in two gun sections. By July of 15, uh, there were 13 of these sections deployed. By um, April of 1916, there were 40 available. And then by the start of the Somme, there were 113 uh, anti-aircraft guns in France. 87 of those were along the front lines. Eight were assigned to general headquarters. And 18 were positioned along primary communications routes. One of the biggest problems that happened early on uh, was with the type of shell that was used. Uh, the Germans had some issues with this. The Germans were using a uh, essentially kind of an incendiary shell initially because they thought they were going to primarily be targeting balloons. Uh, the, the British were using a shrapnel shell, not a high explosive shell, but a shrapnel shell. A uh, big problem with the shrapnel shell was that a big chunk of the casing remained after uh, the charge detonated which meant that you had a fairly heavy chunk of metal falling on your own lines. And of course in London, this was really unacceptable. So there was a pretty rapid move to, uh, to high explosive. Uh, so there's a lot of commentary about how the color of the shell burst changes uh, over the course of the war as both the British and Germans move from uh, their earlier uh, shrapnel shells uh, or incendiary shells, which burst white uh, to the high explosive, which burst black. The uh, uh, high, unfortunately for the British, the, their high explosive shell production was flawed, and it really wasn't until 1916 that they had a, an effective high explosive shell. Uh, that uh, unfortunately, what was happening is they weren't because of the, the war emergency, uh, the machining was not very effective, and so they were actually uh, detonating uh, in the tube and blowing up the, the guns. Uh, so really. British anti-aircraft fire is not effective at all uh, in, until 1916. Uh, so similar to the Germans, uh, they were typically deploying these sections a little bit behind the lines. For the British, it was about two and a half to three and a half uh, kilometers behind the lines. They wanted to make sure that they were out of sight of observ enemy observation balloons so they wouldn't be subjected to counter-battery fire. Um, the uh, searchlights uh, were first used in uh, Santa Mar. Uh, the, uh, they started using them later, so kind of like the Germans, uh, late 16 into 17. Uh, they were later used in uh, Calais, um, I guess it's Audric, um, and there was ultimately a searchlight belt that stretched from the coast to Ypres with 16 sections of two lights each. And this forced, the, uh, in terms of changing behavior, uh, this forced the enemy night raiders from 4,000 feet to over 8,000 feet. Um, and ultimately, uh, night strafing did become a problem later in the war, and so they had to begin uh, covering uh, some of the road networks with uh, searchlights as well. Uh, each light uh, was protected by a Lewis gun crew. I think I've got a, some more of our truck mounted. This was actually in Cape Town. Oh, there we go. So uh, here's, here's one of the searchlight uh, positions. So, so you can see it's got a, a Lewis gun essentially strapped to it. So if anybody uh, opened fire on it, uh, um, basically they're just returning fire right along the axis of the, of the searchlight. Uh, by 1918, the uh, British had gone to four gun anti-aircraft sections. And these were uh, deployed under the artillery. Uh, auspices. So at the beginning of the war, it's actually Royal Flying Corps is uh, is uh, managing it, but by this time at the end, it's it's the uh, artillery commander. And so 40% of the uh, British AA guns uh, at the end of the war were deployed 
in the uh, kind of front line area, and the, the remainder were positioned at the uh, um, at the rear. The uh, probably one most interesting uh, anti-aircraft story for uh, the British, though, is the defense of London. Uh, so, obviously, right at the outset, there is a, uh, a fear of the Zeppelin, uh, even early in the fall of, of 1914. And so we see here, um, uh, I think this is Lambeth Bridge, and, uh, and this is September of 14. And you can see it's all lit up. Um, the uh, Zeppelin Raiders, as they came in, um, were um, certainly a significant challenge. Uh, the uh, initial plan was uh, uh, after, after these uh, mid-1915 attacks, uh, there, there was a change in leadership. So uh, Admiral Sir Percy Scott was brought in to kind of address the shortfalls in defensive capability. And he's really uh, creating the first significant integrated air defense network. And he realizes that what you need are a system of forward observation posts that have direct uh, landline communications to uh, a substation and then a central uh, processing facility, so kind of a forerunner of maybe the filter station in, in World War II. And one of the things that they realize is they need better mobility within uh, the London area, and so they wind up bringing in the French uh, mobile uh, art, uh, anti aircraft artillery, which we'll see in a minute, the uh, which were the 75 millimeter autocannons. Uh, the first Zeppelin shot down by anti aircraft fire was L 15 on April 1st of 1916. Uh, ultimately, what they do is uh, develop a, uh, and here we can actually see uh, some of the, uh, the French guns there that have been uh, brought in for the defense of London. Uh, so the, uh, this is a diagram of the uh, air defenses of, of London. Uh, so this is the, kind of the ultimate build out. So we see a, uh, essentially four rings. It's, it's a little hard to discern them here, but uh, you have uh, kind of the, the city core, and there's a, there's a, a ring of, around the city. Um, this is designed to be essentially an air defense area, so uh, the anti-aircraft guns would not be firing on the aircraft that would be responsible for uh, intercepting in that area. And then there are uh, a series of barriers uh, out over the coast that are designed to, to pick up and engage the uh, Zeppelins or um, power planes or whatever is, is raiding um, a little bit further out. The uh, uh, requirement that Scott had specified was uh, initially 475 guns and 500 searchlights. And that was twice the inventory of the entire uh, British Armed Forces at that time. Uh, there was a research establishment also uh, put forward at this time. Uh, so a Cambridge physiologist, and I think the reason that it's a physiologist who was doing this was because the detection that was uh, emphasized at this time was acoustic. So they're using uh, acoustic locators uh, trying to uh, pick up uh, the elevation and, and range or, or uh, direction of, of incoming targets. Uh, so this, uh, this physiologist, A.B. Hill, set up an anti-aircraft experimental section. Uh, this was known as Hill's Bandits. Uh, now, by the time uh, uh, near the end of the war, uh, the Defense of London had finally achieved 249 guns, so they never did get close to that 450. Uh, they did have 323 searchlights. The headquarters was, was run out of horse carts. That was the kind of the filter center. Um, so the different subunits, uh, to give an example, the London West uh, subcommand had 19 guns, uh, 18 of which uh, had overlapping fields of fire, and of uh, 23 night raiders um, uh, that were engaged by them, uh, 11 were brought down by pursuit planes and 12 by anti-aircraft. Uh, barrage balloons were used, and that was to push the raiders over 10,000 feet in sensitive areas. No known raider was lost to a barrage balloon, though there was at least one collision. The um, uh, full integration uh, that I mentioned that Scott had proposed was not achieved until September 1918. Of course, that was four months after the last raid on London. So uh, it was a very uh, extensive effort. 
uh, certainly a, a promising one, but ultimately uh, fell somewhat short uh, of, of what they were uh, hoping to uh, um, implement there in 1915. So the kind of summary of British overall anti-aircraft effectiveness uh, didn't bring anything down in 1914. 1915 brought down 20 aircraft, 1916 brought down 50, 1917, 95, and 1918, 176. Um, I mentioned the uh, 30,000 shell per kill figure that kind of came out in the 20s, and that led to anti-aircraft becoming known as, quote, the great consumptive, right? So it, that's all it does, right, is consume shells and really nothing else. Uh, in terms of uh, actual figures, in 1917, uh, the, the figure was, uh, for the British, 8,000 rounds uh, per kill. Uh, by 1918, this was uh, 4,550 per kill. Uh, in March of 1918, uh, they actually did achieve a rate of one kill per 1,800 shells fired, but that was largely because weather was pushing uh, a lot of the targets down lower. So of the 201 airship sorties against London, 21 airships were shot down. Only three of those were AA. Uh, the 424 airplane sorties against London, 27 airplanes were shot down, about 12 of which uh, were by uh, anti-aircraft fire. Uh, and here's a kind of entertaining footnote. So uh, this is an airship, uh, I think C-23A. Uh, this was brought down by a U-boat uh, on uh, Newquay, uh, on, uh, in, in uh, Cornwall on May 10th of 1918. Uh, U-boats did not have uh, anti-aircraft guns on them like they did in World War II. Uh, this was basically just using a deck gun and holding the uh, envelope. So the, uh, the airship did, did crash on the pier apparently. So uh, there, was, there was a uh, aircraft killed by U-boat uh, during the First World War. Torpedo <laughs> So France is probably, uh, in terms of overall kind of sophistication uh, and effectiveness, uh, probably the, the uh, most interesting, I think, of all the, uh, the partners because they, they are addressing really all of the kind of key technologies. So uh, we mentioned the mobile autocannon, uh, and so these were also in service at the beginning of the war. Uh, they were using the uh, 1897 75 millimeter for this. And by 1910, they had already started pursuing this program because they were, of their own kind of emphasis on balloons, they were looking really at a, for an anti-balloon capability. And uh, the platform they see here uh, was, the development had begun in 1912. There was also a specialized uh, static platform that was developed so that could be emplaced in, in key areas. Uh, they were also a big user early on trying to implement these uh, incendiary smoke shells so you would actually have a smoke trail, and uh, the idea was they would set the uh, uh, balloons on fire with that. Uh, unfortunately, at the, in 1914, even though these were already well in production, uh, there were only two available for the field and ten of the fixed platforms, so really only a small number uh, available at the outset. Uh, the French really did both were, were firm believers in that you needed uh, specialized uh, crews and skill sets for this uh, type of warfare. Uh, they, in June of 1915, they established an instruction center for anti-aircraft fire at what would become Le Bourget. 1915-1916, uh, they saw uh, dedicated French anti-aircraft units, and uh, they used a series of fixed batteries along the length of the, the front, and then the uh, auto cannon were used as uh, essentially a fire brigade uh, to go uh, where uh, conditions were changing. Uh, there were no quantifiable uh, French anti-aircraft victories in 1914 or 1915. In uh, 1916, they had 60, 120 in 1917, and 220 in uh, 1918. Uh, in 1916, the French were expending 11,000 shells per kill, uh, dropping to 7,500 in 1918. And uh, the kill average for the 75 millimeter autocannon uh, was one uh, per 3,227. Uh, they did do some work on machine gun uh, uh, anti-aircraft usage. So they, they began distributing corrector kits for uh, machine guns for anti-aircraft fire in 1916. 
And uh, they started to bear the brunt of night raids in 1916 as well, which created a panic for searchlights. Uh, unfortunately, they, uh, it took a long time to integrate the searchlights, so they really had a, a terrible problem with coordination. And it wasn't really until um, about uh, uh, 1917 that the uh, effectiveness uh, improved. Unfortunately, as the war went on, of course, the uh, raiders, particularly the night raiders, are starting to fly higher, uh, so they were struggling to implement an improved version with a 105 millimeter gun on it. Uh, like the British, the uh, it was the French, and so here's a here's a good view of the auto cannon as it was supplied to the Americans. As we'll see in a minute, the Americans uh, had to again rely, of course, mostly on French equipment, and so here this is kind of the uh, the later war version of the uh, auto cannon here. This is a pretty good uh, depiction of actually how it's uh, employed in the field with the stabilizers out. Um, and there's one of the mobile searchlight <coughs> units. So this is one of the fixed emplacements that I mentioned. Let's see how that was rigged up. Um, and here's the uh, one of the machine guns with the corrector kit on it. Uh, the French were also very uh, interested in sound uh, detection and ranging. And certainly were the most sophisticated of any of the uh, um, uh, warring nations in terms of implementing it. This is the, the Bayoud uh, paraboloid, and so this this uh, you know was implemented <coughs> later uh, in Britain. Uh, you know they have the giant concrete mirrors. Uh, those were implemented in part in relation to the Zeppelin panic, but weren't really effective during the war. Uh, they're best known for their uh, their defensive application in the interwar years. Uh, but the, the French were, were certainly the most effective in terms of developing uh, sound detection systems. Uh, and so the, uh, the Bayou uh, paraboloid was one that was used uh, uh, by the Americans, British, and French. Uh, here we can see some of the other equipment. So uh, that was a German stereoscopic rangefinder, but uh, it was a type that was also put in production French, here's an altimeter. Um, so here we have a uh, uh, essentially a wind correction uh, telescope. Uh, so this is the, uh, the Brock um, kind of uh, azimuth. This is basically uh, setting your uh, um, deflection angles for the guns uh, both horizontally and vertically. Let's see, and they had, here's a little mobile uh, machine gun platform that they were testing out. Uh, and then that was one of their Zeppelin kills. <clears throat> it's Zeppelin the, shot down by the anti-aircraft. Yeah, so that's LZ-77, which was uh, brought down uh, in, in uh, 17. Uh, so the defense of... Uh, uh, no, that didn't work, did it? Sorry, that's a, it's a spad with a searchlight on the front is what it's supposed to be. Not sure what happened to the rest of the image there, uh, but here's here's uh, the air defense plan for Paris, and so this was fairly similar to uh, what the British were doing in terms of setting up um, a variety of listening stations. Uh, there were 483 planes sent against Paris. Um, 13 were brought down by anti-aircraft uh, fire. By the end of the war, the French had a total of uh, 1,500 officers, 40,000 men, 900 guns, 600 searchlights, 600 machine guns, and 1,000 barrage balloons in an anti-aircraft service. So uh, fairly significant overall. Uh, this is an interesting uh, proposal right at the end of, of uh, World War I. So this is a, uh, essentially an integrated fire direction system. So this was integrating the... Uh, both the sound detection system, the searchlights, uh, optical tracker, uh, and the, the guns basically orienting everything electrically uh, in a uh, uh, central fire control system. So this was a patent that was being circulated among, amongst the uh, allies uh, for consideration right at the end of the war. So for the U.S., uh, the uh, We've got uh, some Italians here. I don't have a lot of information on the uh, overall Italian contribution other than these images, but it gives you some sense. There's a naval three-inch gun. 
So that's a uh, Italian barrage balloon uh, for the defense of Venice. And then for the United States, uh, I did find this picture at the Library of Congress. This is from 1910. I don't know anything other, uh, anything else about it except it's supposedly the first American anti-aircraft unit. Uh, my guess is that these are just marksmen, so they're going to go out in their cars and, and just use high-powered <coughs> rifles to target aircraft or balloons. The uh, anti-aircraft service uh, for the Army was not established until the fall of 1917. The first five-week course was uh, held at Fortress Monroe. Uh, and here we can see somebody from the uh, Hoover mission uh, earlier in 1917 looking at uh, French anti-aircraft equipment. Uh, but the first five-week class for anti-aircraft uh, crews was at Fortress Monroe in February of 18. At the end of the war, uh, the AEF had 12,000 personnel uh, in France in anti-aircraft duties. The American average was actually well in excess of any of the other uh, warring combatants. They were averaging one kill per 1,055 rounds expended. Uh, so presumably training is part of this. They're also using equipment that's been finessed quite a bit, so they're getting fairly good French equipment. Um, they, you know, they're, they're getting ample opportunity to, to learn uh, the, the procedures before they go uh, uh, overseas. So between July 17th and November 11th, uh, 17 planes are brought down, and the, the kill average there is 605 rounds per, uh, to, to achieve each of those kills. So a lot better uh, than the other nations. Uh, the 23rd uh, anti-aircraft uh, company brought down nine planes in less than four minutes on one engage, engagement. So that was the uh, most significant achievement of any uh, American unit. Uh, only one U.S. unit was able to deploy to France with its own uh, Armament, uh, everything else uh, essentially being provided by the French, uh, and in most cases the uh, Americans were actually co-deploying with the French. So uh, all of the uh, uh, detection, ranging, communications part of it, that was really all being uh, uh, conveyed by the uh, French. I actually just came across an interesting article uh, came out just after the war by uh, an American uh, searchlight officer. And one of the things that they were completely unprepared for was working with this French uh, communication network. And they were using a, uh, essentially an er early version of the uh, you know, military phonetic alphabet. And the uh, American actually had no idea what that was. And so he was completely baffled when he uh, made his first call in uh, uh, about an engagement and uh, didn't know what they were saying. So nobody had briefed him on on the communication procedure. So clearly there was a, a pretty high learning curve. Uh, for the San Miguel uh, Offensive, the AEF fielded 36 of the 75 millimeter guns. They put theirs about four kilometers behind the front. And during that uh, campaign, they engaged 18 aircraft and only brought down one. For the Meuse Argonne, uh, they fielded 54 75 millimeter guns, uh, 28 for rear areas. Um, and they engaged 68 German planes and brought down four. Uh, between September 26th and November 11th, the AEF engaged uh, 395 planes and shot down 12. And as I mentioned, the uh, one distinction with the American forces is that they use machine guns much more broadly than uh, any of the other partners. So they were distributing them to uh, field artillery units, uh, to infantry units, and for that reason, we see uh, countless pictures of, of Americans with anti-aircraft machine guns in the AEF. Uh, one place where the Americans really excelled, uh, and so here we see some of the larger caliber uh, work being done in the US. Here's a modification of the French fixed position. Uh, so this is one that's actually in France. Uh, but searchlights were probably the, the big American contribution to the war effort. The Americans seem to be incredibly effective at producing uh, high-power searchlights. So we tend to outdo all of the, uh, our allied partners in terms of our searchlight capabilities. So they had all manner of the different ingenious configurations. Uh, so here we can uh, see some being tested. Um, so here's one. Uh, kind of a giant mobile deployable one at uh, Fortress Monroe. And you see the Coast Artillery is, uh, is managing, that's why they're at Fort Monroe. Here's a giant Mack truck with the 
than maybe a 60 inch searchlight, which was certainly the, the largest thing going out there. Um, here we see the Americans uh, embodying a lot of that uh, French fire control uh, and, and tracking technology. So here's a uh, um, basically an elevation uh, system. So we've got recorders, so some fairly sophisticated uh, equipment designed to go along with uh, um, the gun laying. So here we see uh, uh, some coordination uh, equipment designed to give uh, azimuth and bearings, uh, some plotting tables. So uh, some computers, a lot of interesting, this is a, a tachymeter, uh, as it was known. So uh, again, azimuth and elevation tracking, um, sound detection, adopting some of that French equipment that we see here. And here uh, are the Americans using the uh, French 75 millimeter auto cannon in combat. Mentioned the uh, setting the fuses manually. That's what's going on here, uh, fixed position. Uh, so the last thing I have is, uh, a few uh, uh, of the uh, uh, unit logs. Uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting if you get close here, you can see you know that they have it by type of aircraft that they're engaging, um, you know by date. So October 20th, they engaged uh, one uh, DFW four Fockers and fired 24 rounds. Um, and a couple of these, you can see where they actually brought down the aircraft. So um, so this is. I guess fairly typical in terms of uh, uh, the narratives for different engagements. Um, and you can see how many rounds they're getting off for uh, each aircraft that are coming over. Uh, it's very difficult to research these. Um, it's, it's, um, I tried to go through a couple of these. And unfortunately, unlike, say, World War II correspondence files for a unit, uh, at that time, these units kept everything chronologically. It didn't matter if it was somebody issuing a pass or it was a court-martial proceeding or whatever. So the logs are kind of just randomly intermixed in with all that. Uh, so you have to go through dozens or hundreds of pages before you actually come across something interesting like this. Though I do have to say some of the court-martial proceedings